Hello, and welcome to another lecture from CyberMD. Today we'll be covering congenital long QT syndrome as a part of our common EKGs lecture series. It's very important that you understand congenital long QT syndrome for the USMLE Step 1 exam. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our content so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources to students around the world. Let's jump in. Congenital long QT syndrome is an inherited cardiac disorder caused by mutations in the genes encoding ion channels responsible for the repolarization of the heart. These mutations alter the normal flow of ions, leading to prolongation of the QT interval on the EKG and an increased risk of torsades de poince, a life-threatening arrhythmia. Long QT syndrome affects approximately 1 in 2,500 to 1 in 10,000 individuals. It is more common in females than males and it typically will present with cardiac events anywhere from childhood to early adulthood. It's classified into many subtypes based on the specific ion channel gene mutation. The most common subtype is LQT1. The age of onset and the severity of symptoms can vary significantly between subtypes. In some cases, symptoms may not develop until adolescence or adulthood. It's not necessary to differentiate the different subtypes on the USMLE Step 1 exam. In normal individuals, ion channels in the heart allow for the flow of positively charged ions such as potassium and sodium in and out of the heart cells. This flow helps regulate the heart's electrical activity and ensures a stable heart rhythm. However, in individuals with long QT syndrome, Mutations in the ion channel genes alter the normal flow of ions, leading to prolongation of the QT interval on the EKG and an increased risk of torsades. This can result in episodes of ventricular fibrillation, which can lead to cardiac arrest and sudden death. Long QT may be congenital in origins, secondary to mutations in genes such as the KCNQ1 gene which alters the proteins that normally make up these ion channels that we're talking about. More commonly, however, it is an acquired disease secondary to medications such as antiarrhythmic drugs, think about sodalol and amiodarone, antibiotics such as macrolides and fluoroquinolones, antipsychotics such as haloperidol and olanzapine, and gastric motility drugs such as cisacepride. Many patients with long QT syndrome may present with a history of syncope, especially during exercise and periods of high emotions. Syncope immediately upon diving into water is a classic history finding for long QT type 1. Other presentations include presyncope, palpitations, seizures, and cardiac arrest. However, it is crucial to note that some individuals with long QT syndrome may have no symptoms or have only mild symptoms that are not easily recognized. I went to high school with a girl who passed away during college from long QT, and her main presenting symptom were these vague GI-related symptoms. So, although that's anecdotal evidence, it serves to further the point that the symptoms for long QT are not always easily recognizable. The physical exam of these patients is often benign, there is some association with skeletal abnormalities and cognitive or behavioral problems in certain subtypes, such as LQT7 and LQT8. However, this is extremely, extremely low yield for your exam. The diagnosis of long QT syndrome is made based on a combination of the patient's history, physical exam, and EKG findings. The EKG may show a prolonged QT interval and in really severe cases, torsades de poince. In some cases, genetic testing may be necessary to confirm the specific subtype of long QT syndrome. On EKG, the QT interval must be calculated and compared to the normal range. It is important to calculate a corrected QT when assessing the heart rates inside of 60 to 100 beats per minute. You don't need to know this formula for your exam, but the corrected QT is equal to the QT interval on your EKG divided by the square root of the R to R interval. Again, that's outside the scope of step one. 
A quick and dirty method is just if the QT interval is equal to or greater than half of the R to R interval, you should have a higher suspicion for long QT syndrome. Again, most of this is outside the scope of step one, but it is useful to know for clinical rotations and the quick and dirty method would be useful on step one. Treatment for long QT syndrome depends on the severity of the symptoms and the specific subtype. For asymptomatic individuals, lifestyle changes, such as avoiding activities that trigger symptoms, may be sufficient. For individuals without symptoms, medications such as beta blockers can be prescribed to slow down the heart rate and reduce the risk of torsades. In severe cases, an implantable cardiac defibrillator may be recommended. If the patient is in torsades, the first-line treatment is IV magnesium sulfate. Long QT syndrome can be confused with other causes of sudden cardiac death, such as Brugada syndrome, drug-induced QT prolongation, and epileptic seizures. It is important to consider other possible diagnoses, especially in cases where the EKG findings are not clearly diagnostic of long QT syndrome. The prognosis for individuals with long QT syndrome varies widely depending on the type or subtype and the severity of symptoms. With proper management and treatment, most individuals with long QT syndrome can lead a normal life. However, some individuals may still be at risk of sudden death, even with proper treatment. Therefore, it's important for individuals with long QT syndrome to be under regular medical supervision and to avoid activities that can trigger symptoms. Sudden death is the most severe and life-threatening complication of long QT syndrome. In addition, individuals with long QT syndrome may also experience syncope and seizures. These complications can be prevented with proper treatment and management. In conclusion, congenital long QT syndrome is a critical topic for the USMLE Step 1 exam and one that you need to have a thorough understanding of. Making sure you understand the etiology, the pathophysiology, history, physical, EKG findings, as well as treatment and differential diagnosis are all very important aspects of this condition. I hope this lecture has provided you with a better understanding of long QT syndrome and will help you excel on your USMLE Step 1 exam. Thanks for tuning in.